Welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Burtz, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. And today I am so excited to have an amazing guest. We're in for a big treat today. John Seal is here. John is an Australian cinematographer, an Oscar winner, and member of the Australian Cinematographer Society. Among his works are Mad Max, Fury Road, Cold Mountain, The English Patient, Rain Man, Witness, The Perfect Storm, and so many others I could go on. Um, John, this is a huge honor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for asking. And you are you are down under right now, is that right? We're, I'm in Sydney. I'm in Sydney, coming out of COVID lockdowns and very happy about that. <laughs> it sounds like it's been pretty rough. You guys have had um, a much stricter go than I think the, most of the world has. Oh, we have. And I think a lot of people are questioning it now whether we needed to do that. But I think the end, end, the long term end result um, with the minimum number of people uh, that have actually got it and have, have very sadly passed away compared to the uh, rest of the world uh, could very well end up being, uh, you know, a general attitude of that was the right way to go was to lock everything up and keep everybody at home and not let it spread. So we're coming out of it now, and I think I think Australia, it's more than Freedom Day, it's Freedom Week, it's Freedom Year, we're off. <laughs> There's going to be dancing in the streets. Well, I, um, I heard your podcast on t the Team Deacons, Roger Deacons and James podcast, and it was such an amazing story. And I have a very small filmmaking, I have a desire to become a filmmaker. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, like we were talking about, from where you and Roger Deakins are. Uh, and I had, when I was in space, I had a chance to um, help make an IMAX movie called A Beautiful Planet. And Tony Myers was our director. Yeah. Yep. And I don't know if you know James Nyhouse. He was our director of photography. Um, I haven't met him, no. But I've heard yeah. of him, obviously. Yeah. He, he's, he and Tony have made all the IMAX movies going back since the beginning of the space program. Unfortunately, Tony passed away, but she was my mentor. She got me motivated to film make and, and I, um, I had a chance to direct my first feature documentary a couple of years ago, which was really exciting. So I'm just excited to talk to the, the person who's done it for real. But the story, I, I have a feeling that a lot of my listeners are not also listening to the Deacons podcast because it's such a different you know demographic in general. But your story of how you got to be a filmmaker was amazing. And I just wonder if you could just ever jump into that. I, I was thinking of the man from Snowy River as I was hearing your story. <laughs> Not quite that. Um, no, it, it's one of those uh, sad stories, I feel, um, of a youth uh, coming out of a high school not doing that well at high school because there was no desire to go anywhere i.e. university or, or a particular profession. So I just sloped through school, <clears throat> spent most of the time surfing instead of studying, uh, silly things like that. And then I kicked around Sydney for a while, just odd jobs. I love sailing. So I worked in a ship chandlery selling bits and pieces uh, of boats. And uh, But then I finally met an uncle that I'd never, ever met uh, who lived up in Queensland, and he had a, for the, for the area, he had a small uh, holding up there, sheep station, we call them, and um, I went up to meet him. I had a bet with some local guys I was working with, and they said I couldn't hitchhike to Queensland, meet him and hitchhike back in a week. And uh, so I took them on, and off I went, and I met my uncle, and I liked him a lot. He was a big Scotsman. And he just loved the soil and the, uh, the animals and the farming. And the, he loved it all and the big, wide open spaces. And then he said to me, he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, kicking around Sydney. And uh, he said, well, do you want to come out and be a jackaroo? And, and I thought, I thought, why not? Um, you know, I'm just kicking around doing nothing i might as well go over the mountains and have a look at the outback so way i went help us out with jackaroo what is what is jackaroo for, kind for of like uh, i suppose a junior cowboy okay. um you're taught how to fix fences gates uh mm -hmm. windmills keep the water up to the sheep check all of the the uh the uh uh, bore water that's coming up out of the ground you've got to make right. sure that's all running nicely 
looking after sheep, horses, dogs, you name it, cars, trucks, everything, just a general sort of know-it-all who doesn't, isn't always right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a ranch hand. And where is yeah. Queensland for the, for the, un, for the unsophisticated Americans up here? It, it describe like New South Wales and Sydney. You know, we know what Australia looks like, but where, so where are you going in there? Well, it's the eastern side, really. If you cut if you cut Australia down the middle, there's sort of really three states along the eastern seaboard uh, of the mainland, and that's Queensland in the north, and New South Wales in the middle, and Victoria at the bottom. If you go anywhere past the mountain range, which is basically around along the coast of the east coast of Australia, once you go over those mountains. It just becomes as flat as it just flattens out right. all the way to Perth in the Western Australia. Right. <laughs> There's a couple of little noggly bits stick up, you know, like Ayers Rock pops out of the flat ground, but otherwise it just flattens out. So I went out there and he had a small, as I said, a reasonably small holding for that area of uh, 30,000 acres. Um, and, and, you know, our horse paddock was 4,000 acres to hold uh, eight horses. So uh, it, it was wow. quite a, what I, what I thought was large. But right. for, the, for the area, it was quite a small area. So I had to learn to ride horses uh, as well. And that involved a bit of falling off and being thrown off and bucked off and you name it, you know. Well, those mountains isn't the movie, The Man from Snowy River. You know, I saw that years ago and I, lo I loved it. It's one of my favorite films. Um, is that where those mountains are? It was really cold and snowy. It it's was like, kind of yeah. yeah, the continuation of the mountains all the way down to into Victoria. Okay. And they get a little bit higher and more rugged there. Victoria, being further south, gets right. uh, a bit more of a bitter winter than we do in Sydney. Right. So it was all set down there. It's a pretty butch area, actually. Right. Up here, south means cold, warm, but down there, south means cold. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you basically were a cowboy. You were a ranch hand, and then you ended up winning Oscars and directing all of the best movies of the last 30 or 40 years. Or not directing, uh, director of photographer, if that's a verb. How does that, tr how does that transition happen? Well, I, I came out of an artistic family in Sydney. My father was a, a black and white artist, and uh, I still to this day love his stuff, his sense of composition, untrained sense of competition, uh, composition is extraordinary, and I love it. And uh, I, I think uh, my sister was very uh, uh, creative in painting and other works, um, and I think by going out there, out back, I took a little eight mil camera with me. I had been playing around with an eight mil camera back in those days. And a mates and I had been making little movies, you know, we sort of burnt uh, corks and put stubble on and became baddies. And uh, we had a lot of fun doing that uh, growing up. And so right. I, took that, I took that little camera with me to record life uh, out there, out back, and sent it back to my parents, and they took it down to the chemist and got it processed. Mm -hmm. And I left them a little projector, and they put it on the projector and watch, watch these movies of what I was doing. Um, sound or no sound? No sound. No, no. Yeah. I had to write long letters <laughs> <laughs> and, and to put them in the film box. But uh, it was two years, of course. Oh, wow. I was out. I was out there. And over that two years, I got there when there was a drought had been on for about three years. I saw another two years of that drought and then it broke. And that was the most amazingly wonderful uh, night uh, uh, that uh, I'd, I'd ever experienced up to the age of 18, 19. Uh, you know, the smell of, of, of uh, rain in the soil and, and mm. all of the smells came through it. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. But the, but the next day we had to rush around and try and save the sheep because they'd got bogged in these, what we used to call crab holes mm. that um, the earth would over five years had dried out and cracked. 
Right. And they were quite deep and uh, riding these stupid horses that uh, <laughs> wanted to kill us all the time. You had to let them have their head and find their own way through the crab holes. But a little bit dangerous uh, with those horses were pretty wild. And if you let their heads go, they'd immediately throw their head between their front legs and buck you off. Right. So you had to balance this tension of the reins to let them have their head, but not enough for them to start bucking and throw you. I got thrown off a couple of times, quite a long way from the homestead at dusk and have to walk back one, uh, or, two, one or two miles. The in horse doesn't wait for you after he bucks you. He doesn't stand there and wait for you to get no, back. No, no, no. Generally, I left the gates open behind me, mustering uh, the sheep out to the outer paddocks. Right. And and the horse would then just race home. <laughs> Go stand and there. There's, and a, wait <laughs> there's a lovely tradition, Terry, comes out of that from the man from Snowy River, mm-hmm. in fact, in that the the if a riderless horse ever comes into a um, into a homestead, everybody goes out looking for it for you. Because uh. there's there's something that could very well have happened to you in, in injury. Right. And they immediately, um, and, and it, it much much that the shearers huh. um, dislike the jackaroo. The jackaroo works from dawn till about, say, nine o'clock, bringing the sheep in, yarding them, sorting them. Right. And then, he, then he, he's got to wait until the shearers have finished shearing. And then he starts work again resaddles the horses and gets takes the, the sheep back out. But during the day he's sleeping. Right. You, know, you, you get in amongst the wool bales and have a nice sleep, you know. And the <laughs> shearers look at you up there and they go, you know, they kind of ingrain hate of the jackaroo who sleeps all day while they work. But when the riderless horse comes in, they are the first ones there out there looking for you. And 30,000 acres in the, in the dark, is a lot of land to look at. That's a lot of land, yeah. That reminds me of Witness. I just watched that movie last night preparing for this when they the boy rang the bell. I don't know if you remember that and all the, yeah. the neighbors came to you know to help. It is. Yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely piece of humanity that comes through that much right. you can have a surface dislikes, the the deep <laughs> down desire to help, you help each other out. Yeah, it is really yeah. strong. It's it was really great, I think. Well, that, so if, if, can I tell you a story real quick about Australia? So on my first space flight, I installed this module called the cupola and it's a big seven windowed module on the bottom of the space station. And we installed it and I got to be the first person to open up these window covers and all these pictures I took were from the cupola. Um, And then we had to get back to work. And so we opened up the windows, we left them open, the window covers, not the windows. And, um, and then I'm in there putting cables in and turning wrenches and and all of a sudden the whole ISS turned red. And that was not normal. I remember looking around and my crewmates, we looked at each other like, what's going on? So I went down to the cupola and it, it was like we were we f- were flying over Mars. And I looked out and it was Australia. It was the outback. And there, it's so red in the outback that it literally turned the inside of the ISS red. And the, I have a chapter called Colors in the first book I wrote. It was about getting to know the earth by colors, but that red color of the outback, I guess there's a lot of iron in the soil and it's kind of rusting, I guess is what's happening, but um, it, it, it makes an impression from space. I don't know if you notice that from the ground or not, but um, it was one, very unique on earth for sure. It is. It is. And as I said, once you cross the mountains and it starts yeah. to flatten out, you can go into a sort of lovely... Um, uh, plains, which is the wheat belt, and then it slowly gets drier and drier, and the further out you get, and then the soil starts to change into the the red center. We call it the red center, um, and it's it red. Slowly <laughs> yeah. It is red. <laughs> I can hear that. So, so you're out there making these eight millimeter films on the old, the little round containers yeah. of film and there's a show called uh man in the high castle i don't know and there's they're always chasing these rolls of film um and you end up in movies and i wonder if you could just take us through the different roles that you can get 
on a movie set. I think most of us, everybody loves movies. Everybody loves TV, but very few of us actually understand exactly what's going on. We know the actors, we know the directors in charge, but like, can you talk us through that and how you made it through different roles on, on a movie set or on a TV set? Well, I, I, I left. I left the. Uh, what happened after the drought broke? We we rushed out to try and save sheep. Right, right, right. And we we couldn't. We <laughs> saved maybe a hundred, who were got bogged in the crab holes, which <clears throat> filled with water, and the black soil became like a glue, and the sheep with the wool on them, got sucked into that. They'd fall into it, and they couldn't get their leg out by suction <clears throat> and. So we rushed, we couldn't drive tractors, horses, uh, jeep. We couldn't do move anything. It all stuck inside the mud guards. Then you couldn't steer the thing. The horses had built up under their hooves and threatened to break their ankles. Right. So we just had to walk. And, well, you know, 30,000 acres, you can't do the whole lot. So about three weeks later, we cleaned mustard the entire block and... We found we'd lost 3,000 head of sheep overnight. Oh my God. And so we were down to 5,000 head of sheep on 30,000 acres. I mean, that's, and I started to think, this is hopeless. <laughs> this place is hopeless. You know, you, right. if you haven't got enough rain, you've got too much. Right. And, and it doesn't help, you know. So the little camera became more and more important to me i started looking at it and thinking could you could you get a job and go around the world you know national geographic or some going to places people were game to go to couldn't go to couldn't right. go to, whatever and go there and film it mm -hmm. and so i made that decision and i think very sadly for my uncle um, i parted and i set off south to sydney couple of thousand kilometres in my beaten up old Land Rover and off I, and I sold that on the way, put my thumb in the air, hitchhiked home and then I started a long battle to get into the movie business or the film business, the documentary right. business. Um, back then, there were no film schools. It was just simply the school of hard knocks. Right. You, had to, you had to get a job right. and then get knocked around and taught and learn as you go. Um, so I finally got into a television station uh, called the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting Commission, government run station. And uh, I was a driver for them. And I used to drive the cameraman to their jobs and, and maybe do the sound, uh, magnetic stripe sound, uh, do all that, and then get them home safely. Um, when I say safely, because quite often a lot of these guys were ex uh, ex Second World War combat oh, cameramen yeah. <laughs> or Korean War uh, cameramen, and they pretty well celebrated every day that they were still alive. You know? So there was a whole uh, we'd, we'd often drop them at home and run, you know, just drop on the door and, and prop them up against the door and run. Uh, but That's it was a, it, it was seven years of the best training ground. I not only did documentaries, we did uh, we covered all facets of uh, life, really. Opera house coverage, you know. I moved around from they they did this for us. We moved around from different departments, so I I, I was doing all of that all on sixteen mil back then, mm -hmm. and but then they suddenly decided to do what they called was drama. We, we, we'll get actors and a director and a, and a camera and we'll, we'll record a dramatic series. And their thinking back then was, well, if we do that, we'll have to do it on 35 mil, of course, not 16. Mm -hmm. And so they bought the biggest, best 35 mil camera. And I was lucky enough at that stage to uh, sort of convince people that uh, I, I really wanted to go ahead with this. Um, and they, they, I, I, I went into the drama section and we went out back. One of the first projects we did was out back near Longreach where I jackaroo. And 
it had actresses and actors and a big camera. And I thought, this is the life. Not only am I in the outback, right. where, which I love, um, but gosh, we've got actors in front of a camera and they're being very dramatic about it. Things are going wrong with the world, you know, and right. they're going to fix it. And we were filming that and I just fell in love right away then and there with uh, movie making with actors and consequently then just zeroed in on that um, for the rest of my life. So the you're talking eight mil, 16 mil, that's the width of the film? Yeah. So yeah. eight mil is eight mil is pretty skinny and sixteen and oh, very small. Very yeah. small. Yeah. Thirty-five. If you had an if you used I used the first camera I got, my parents bought me a Konica 35 millimeter SLR and I had to teach myself focus and exposure and shutter. I had to learn all that stuff when I was in elementary school. Right. Uh, so it's the same width as the old roll of film that you had, only it was a big long, like how big is a 35 mil Hollywood camera? Oh, well, that'll hold a thousand feet of 35 mil. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. So, so they were quite. That's a camera. That's it. Well, they were, they were big, and it was a whole system of dark rooms and changing bags, mm -hmm. blacked out, very light proof changing bags that the, the, we had to get put our hands in and do it all by feel, load the magazines by feel. Different cameras, different problems. But uh, basically, it was a, a learned process. It was a, a ladder you climbed and you became generally, firstly, a clapper loader, which meant that you clacked that stick thing um, with the stripes on it. And right. you load, loaded and unloaded the magazines. Now, the unloading of the magazines was incredibly uh, dangerous in a way because there's a thousand feet of performance has been recorded on that. And so any mistake with light right. is, um, is going to ruin it. Right. And we all make mistakes. Uh, it's like you go into a dark room. And you might be thinking about something and you leave the door open. You switch the light off and you leave right. the door open and unload a magazine. Oops. So you've, ne you've now edge fogged it. Right. And you hope that by processing it, the edge fog hasn't gone into the picture area. If it goes into the picture area, it's got to reshoot the whole thing. So that's a big response. That's a lot of money. So yeah. there's a big responsibility to the clapper loader to learn the system. And, and then you jump the ladder to being a focus puller to make sure that, that basically the camera's built correctly. And then when you're shooting, he, keep, he or she keeps it in focus. Then you moved up to camera operating. So then you operated the camera the way the director and the director of photography wanted, where they want it pointed and how and what height and the movement. And then you worked your way up to maybe, if you're lucky, to become a director of photography, and then you controlled all of that. So it's sort of a, a, a ladder climbing process. Talk about focus pulling. I, I've had a chance to hang out at the ASC Clubhouse and um, get to know different folks. I feel like it's my home away from home. I love the people there. I love that place there in Hollywood. And I've gotten to meet some focus pullers and having pulled focus myself in space, and Tony Myers, our, my mentor, director, used to hammer home the importance of focus. It, focus with these things, this is pretty easy, right? It, it's, under, it's in focus. But can yeah. you make the point of how important focus is? And when the camera's moving and you have depth of field, and can, can you just talk about that a little bit, help, help us understand one of those little things that most people don't ever notice? I, I notice it now when I watch film. It's incredibly, it can be incredibly complex. And they, they become, I, I worked with some guys here in Australia in the early days who were absolutely incredible at, at, at the depth to which they went into focus point. In, in the older days, we had film negative and, and that had a certain grain structure. And they, one of them even, I would be operating a camera and I would say, that's soft. You, just as he came around that corner, he's softish. And the focus puller would say, no, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. And I'd say, I could see it was soft through the camera. And normally that was the gospel. Was right. If the operator saw it was soft, 
it was solved. Through the lens, looking through the... Through the lens, yeah. Right. Because the, when, the, when finally, uh, in the early days, when reflex cameras finally came in, you could actually look through the lens as you right. were shooting. Right. Whereas the first film I ever operated on uh, movie was a rack over Mitchell where you had to rack the whole body of the camera moved off the lens so that you could look through the lens. And then when you wanted to do the take, you turned a handle and the film mechanism transport moved then behind the lens and you had to watch through a viewfinder on the side, which was a deadly game of, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, parallax error. Right, anyway, right, right. The, the reflex camera lets you look through the lens as you were shooting, and that was uh, fantastic. But this focus puller, he, he was always right because he found that he could hide what you could see through the lens, he could hide in the grain. And the grain was going, to, was going to deplete the film of sharpness, the image of sharpness anyway. Right. And that amount of focus that I saw would be lost in that. So it, wow. it yeah. They, 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 and then using depth of field, not point right. of focus, so that an actor could be up on the leading edge of the depth of field and another one would be on the, the rear edge of the depth of field. But if you put that on point focus on the foreground actor, the background actor would be soft. So, so that's could, with the aperture, with the, with the diameter of the lens? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Technically, yep, you can change that distance by increasing or decreasing the aperture. Uh, often a focus puller in later years would say, can I have another stop? Of, of, of light so that if, when I stop down, I'll get a better depth of field uh -huh. and I can then make sure they're both sharp. So as a lighting cameraman, then you would have to either light it up or maybe force develop the stock, uh, push one stop and, and be able to stop down then the uh -huh. diaphragm so that the, the depth of field increased for them. Uh, so it all becomes a lovely combination of people doing their individual jobs that just simply ends up in the same result, which is a, an image that works for the director and the editor. Right. And, and so there's an art and a science to it, I guess. Both. Uh, well, one of the things that amazed me, you know, if for those who haven't worked with big Hollywood cameras, there's a mark on the camera and they gave us a, a tape measure. And I remember thinking, okay, this is, they're going way overboard with the you know, your focus and the focus thing would go around. We had these beautiful Zeiss prime lenses, cine lenses, and um, it would like rotate a couple times. And it was like every inch it was changing and you would actually measure the distance to the object that you were filming down to the inch. And I remember thinking, man, that's overboard. And then I tried it a few times and it was <laughs> it wasn't overboard. <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 I remember when I first started focus pulling that getting the timing of moving with an actor um, yeah. walking towards you or walking away is, is, uh, is an art form in itself. It's just that feeling of being able to pace them right. with this little wheel as they walk away. A lot right. of focus pullers later when I was working with them, they tended to be too quick. It was like they had to change focus from one area to another right. within the frame. And they'd do it, they'd say, oh, I have to change focus now. Boom, I've done it. So when you're watching a movie and you see the subject moving in or out, somebody's very busy rotating the focus knob and you just don't, the audience should, doesn't realize that, but that's a big thing. So no, they're, they're, there's smoke coming out of that. You know, they're trying, they're trying to, especially on action movies, you know. Where, right. Uh, there's this contraption that you can attach to it so that you can adjust it like this so you're not bouncing the camera around. And I could never figure out how to get that, the knob attached properly. And anyway, <laughs> it's a whole thing. So we were we were filming this one scene and, and I said, let me go get some lights. We've got to light it, blah, blah, blah. And one of my crewmates is like, ah, lighting doesn't matter, that it'll be fine. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm just a fighter pilot, but I think lighting is pretty important. So, on a, I just you're, you're laughing and every filmmaker in here's head is exploding. So can you walk us through lighting? Like who does the lighting? Who does the electrics? Who there's other jobs that are really important 
But I think lighting is one of the most important. It's what I, when I watch movies, it's what I appreciate the most is a well-lit scene. Well, I think you know, when you become a director of photography, you take on a, a big load of responsibility that goes all the way down that ladder, basically, to the bottom. Right. You, you need to know about what the clapper load is doing. In the older days, when we had film negative, uh, there was a slow speed negative and a high speed negative. You had to make sure that the right negative was going into the camera with the clapper loader. Um, What's a negative? What do you mean by negative? The negative stock the, that goes the film. The, the film. Yeah. The, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think the new film, right? Okay. Yeah, we tend to call it the negative. The, the negative. The negative okay. the I negative. didn't realize. Yeah. And so then you go to the positive, which is your final, which is your print. After uh, you process it. Okay. So negative yeah. is what you put in, and positive is what you get out after it's processed. Uh, Yes, on reversal stock, it was. There was a film stock that was the negative and the positive. And through the processing, yeah, you processed the negative and it went to a positive. That's reversal stock. But when you're shooting main big 35 mil drama, uh, you always use a negative in the camera. Right. Okay. And then that is processed as a negative. So it's rever everything's reversed on it. The right. Colors. Um, and then you print the positive of that okay and that then comes back to what it should look like that's what you so, put in a projector to watch yeah so putting film in the camera is is uh, is a very generalized uh, sort of term to use whereas if you're putting negative into the camera you know exactly what's going in it what ah, should be okay in. i did not uh, in other that. words it's specifying which film to put in right that makes it could be a High speed negative. There could be the low speed negative. There could right. be. There were we had different negatives in those earlier days uh, right. uh, of film, and so you you call, always called it a negative, and okay. maybe by the number, you know, the number was a designated uh, film negative. Uh, you could put you know put the five two one nine in, um, or the whatever number it was. Or I used to keep it simple because I'm a simple man, but, you know, put the high speed negative in, put right. the low speed in, whatever. Right. So, okay. But all that's changed now with digitization. You know, the digital revolution is, is a real revolution of image making and it's quite extraordinary. But uh, all of that process with all those people as a director of photography, you need to keep your brain running as to what's happening down there is influencing that, is influencing the camera operator is influencing the direct photography, which is, and you're obeying the director um, as to his, her demands as to that shot. Right. And ha how it should look. You've gone through a long pre-production of discussing how the, how the film will look, what the feeling of, of the uh, images are to the audience. Um, are you using special filters to make it look like an older film, um, color changes or contrast, grad filters going in and out of the camera. You know, you you're playing with a lot of lot of things to get that final result. So it's it's something that uh, something that can be learnt by the ladder system, so that that's locked in. You can feel and know exactly what everybody's doing to get to that image. So that I have a lot of questions about that. Um, I do want to come back to lighting because I think that's super important. But look and feel, I, you know, how much of that is the deep the DP director of photography? I think in Europe they call it DOP. You also hear cinematographer, but that's basically you, right? That's the person in charge of the cameras, and it, that's the person who shoots the movie with the help of a big team, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so how much does the cinematographer work on that? How much does the director work? Um, do actors and writers and producers, do they have input into that? What the movie's gonna look like? Like I imagine you had a lot of discussions about Mad Max, because that had a that had a pretty unique look to it, I think. Terry, it changes with every film. Every I I I I think I learned very quickly that every film is different and should be different. Right. Um, I watched a lot of our masters of, of cinematography take their style, which is a very lovely style, and obviously they like it. They would take it from one film to the next to the next. Um, I did actually disagree with that. I felt that 
every script that I read is different. And it's in a different place, a different time. Um, and it, we should have a different mind about it as a cinematographer, not take something we liked the look of in the last right. film or whatever. Right. We shouldn't take that to the next one. So I always tried to take enough time off to say the next film is the first one I've ever shot. Right. I have no, I have no pretenses in my mind as to how it should look. Let me read it, talk to the director. So some directors are very explicit. Right. And some aren't. Right. Um, some just say, let's go shoot it <laughs> with what we get. Right. Okay. Okay. So Who's a that. director like that? Uh, uh, I think I can be very honest and say that uh, Rain Man mm -hmm. uh, with Barry Levinson was very like that. A and in a way, it was correct. I was looking for some feeling of, um, of image emotion. And he just said, no, no, it's a contemporary movie. It's, it's today. They're traveling right. across the United States. We're going to do that. Let's go. Let's right. just go shoot it. Right. But we did. Whatever we got, we shot, you know. Right. The only thing right. I will say that I did was that I felt that their voyage, their trip, their traveling was on the road. Mm -hmm. And at all times, I tried to use grad filters to make the road a, another principle in the frame. What's a grad filter? It's a graduated filter from clear through a, an edging, which can be soft or hard, into a, a neutral density. It could be a one-stop, two-stop, three-stop neutral density, which robs that area of the frame from, from uh, getting the uh, proper amount of light. You, you're actually underexposing by 0.3 with one stop. 0.6 or 0.9, right. three stops. Um, so that what you can do is then highlight an area of the right. frame with the grad filter. Okay. And then with your, with your aperture, you then compensate either side. You can either underexpose that uh, area in the neutral density, or you can overexpose the area that isn't in the neutral density. So there's a, have you seen the new James Bond film? Not yet. No time to die. There's a scene, there's a big party and all the bad guys are converging on him and James Bond is in the middle, well lit. And so he like is bright, he stands out and everybody else is dark in the background. And is that an example of how you might use? It could be, but that, that I mean, yeah. more than likely sounds it was lit that way. I think it was uh, lit that way too, yeah. yeah. Possibly. Uh, whereas shooting Rain Man and a lot of other films, um, I used a lot of grads wow. to try and get a, a, a different shape to the light. Okay. A different shape to, the, to what nature was giving us and try and emphasize clouds. Right. A polar, a polar screen, rotated polar screen, will darken the sky, but not the clouds. Okay. So you can, you can make clouds look very powerful. You Using can do the same. Right. I I, I, I didn't like the polar screens. I liked the grads. And I'd bring the grad down to the horizon uh, when shooting, say, gorillas in the mist. Right. I would, I would bring it down into the mountains. <laughs> so the mountains were going dark at the top and the clouds were now more powerful. Right. And, and the darkening of the, the mountains, um, it looked good. It made the mountains look more powerful more dangerous maybe a little darker up the top there right you know you didn't know what was up there so uh, i used them a lot and i used used to cut them out to shapes that i wanted to to uh, change within the frame uh, you know millions of people saw gorillas in the mist and i bet you hundreds of them know what you're saying right now you know everybody yeah. saw the image and thought man that's amazing or it's beautiful or it made them feel a way they didn't even realize it uh but this, well, is, see, this is why yeah, i love this that's where it's interesting. I did two jungle movies fairly close together. One was Mosquito Coast in yeah. Central America with Peter Weir. And, um, and then I did the uh, Michael Apted film, Gorillas in the Mist. Now, Peter's film in Central America, he wanted a dirty jungle. 
He wanted a jungle that nobody would walk into. Right. There was no appeal in that jungle at all. Right. So the selection of our film negative was uh, Fuji film as against Kodak or, or Agfa, which was running at the time. I tested all three and found that the Fuji was best suited. It did not like the greens. It made them into a drab olive green, <clears throat> uh, which was not appealing at all. And Peter loved it. So we shot the whole film on that. But Gorillas in the Mist was Diane Fossey's jungle. And it had to have an appeal to it. So I used Agfa. And the Agfa, Agfa loved the greens. So it automatically, through the negative, it automatically was putting a lovely colour tone to our positive um, that was appealing. So you, this is where you juggle the tools that you have. In front so, of you. so today, would you? So when we did that movie, One More Orbit, the one I had to. We were hoping to have one company was going to provide all the cameras and that ended up not happening. And we used 12 different types of cameras, which was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for color correction, as you can imagine, in post. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the red camera had a great I love the red look for people. And, you know, Ari has a certain look. Canon has a certain look. In the old days, it was Agfa, Kodak or Fuji, right, for the film. But today, today you've got Ari, Canon red uh cat uh who else sony there's you know is that oh. you choose a camera based on that does the director say what he wants or do you get to choose that or which camera to use um no i i no i mean there has been cases i've heard on the grapevine where cameramen have been told to use a certain camera because mm -hmm. they're cheaper right um, or they have a deal with a studio or something yeah yeah, or an actor loved the camera, so he said, we're using that. Right. Uh, an actor with a lot of clout, obviously, in the production. Right. So right. Uh, there are examples I've heard of that, but I think the funny story on Fury Road was that I had never done a digital film. It, somehow I'd been saved that all the <laughs> way through to the doing the tourist um, in Venice was on film, and then I had a little bit of a break of a year or so, and then suddenly Fury Road came up and we had a big meeting and, and uh, uh, George was building his own 3D cameras. I mean, they were incredible things. And I came on board and I was a bit taken aback with these, di uh, these uh, digital 3D cameras uh, in build because, boy, they had a few problems and uh, we had to solve those quickly. But then one day George sat down at the Monday morning meeting and he just said, okay, we're not going 3D, we're going 2D. George. Pardon? George who? Uh, Miller, director. Okay, George Miller, director, okay. He, he uh, uh, stood up and he said, I've got to think, we're not going 3D, we're going 2D. Uh, and everybody went, woo. So he turned to me and he said, uh, Johnny, what cameras would you use? Would you be using if we go 2D? And I had never done a digital film. I had never tested one. So I had to sit there and I said, well, George, uh, I'm a Panavision man, always have been, always will be. Uh, I'll give them a ring, see what they've got and start testing. And the first AD leant over and he said, Alexis, Johnny, Alexis. And I said, probably Alexis, George, first up. They'll be our first. Very good, Johnny. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> so... I ended up with Alexis. Alexis by then had, had been a, a proven combat camera, what I call it, combat camera, going into battle to make a movie. They had been proven all over the world uh, in various situations of cold right. and jungle and wet, moist, had proved themselves already to be a very reliable camera. So Panavision were handling those. So I went with those and uh, never looked back. They were great. Right. And so you, you, you don't have a, a favorite that you, you know, enjoyed using or? I've never really, Terry, been overly excited about the technicalities of cameras, mm -hmm. more excited about what they're doing. Right. What are they shooting, you know, with right. the actors and the, the drama and performance in, in front? I'm, I'm always much more interested in that. I stayed a camera operator long after all of my peers uh, started lighting 
and I ended up actually camera operating for them because I loved working the camera. Why is it here? Why isn't it there? Why isn't it you know, lower? You know, right. what, what's the power of the image uh, building into the performance? Right. Well, helping to build. Uh, I was much more interested in that than whether or not the lenses were the sharpest lenses in the world or they right. had the best resolution or uh, that didn't interest me. I, I must say I had to be interested. I had to match the lenses and try and match the colour in the early days. Um, you don't have to worry about any of that now. Post is just taken over. You don't worry about any colour. You know, uh, on our last little film, which is my uh, just finished with George Miller again, we were using the Alexis, which are a highly expensive camera, and we also used another one which had just come out that was petty cash, and they were compatible. So, you know, a little, a little bit of a grain change on them, uh, but that was all. Their contrast ratios and colour were very compatible. So you've got a $200,000 camera and you've got a $5,000 camera, and they both do the same job, basically. They're pretty close. That's the RA close enough, Alexa, is that right? Sorry? That's the RA Alexa? The RA Alexa. Yeah. yeah, and uh, uh, I will stay with the Komodo, the new Komodo, which um, is a red, which is a red-based chip. Red, um, red is a camera company. I actually, the Red Dragon flew to the space station in 2014, I think, and I I shot the first ultra high def and the on the Red Dragon in space. You can, Google, you can Google like ISS UHD, and it was it's beautiful. I mean, the the images are yeah. just gorgeous. Um, uh, Terry, can I can yeah. I ask a question? Because sure. uh, yeah, did you have an interest in photography before that happened, or did that create your interest? No, no, no. When I was a kid, like I said, um, my parents got me a Konica SLR yep. camera, so you had to put the film in and wind it manually. I remember one Christmas I got the bolt-on thing, the um, automatic, you know, winder, so that I could take multiple yep. pictures at the same time. Otherwise, yep. you take the picture. And you do this and you take the picture, but well, I, and it, it took like eight AA batteries. It was this giant thing. You know, <laughs> I, had one. I had one. I had one too. Yeah. And I had, you know, the $50, 50 millimeter basic lens. You know, I didn't have anything too expensive, but um, I had, like, I had to learn about shutter speed and aperture and practice yeah. different things. And so I, I fell in love with that. I had a, um, I had a Canon for a while. I always had a camera around my neck. And then when my kids were young, I was, I was that dad where, you know, dad, stop taking pictures. Um, so I was always interested in it. And, and so I was in training for the space flight and, uh, on my, I got my iPhone out and looked at my schedule and it said, go to building nine for IMAX training. And I got this big smile on my face. Cause I didn't know I was going to be filming a movie. I didn't even know there was going to be an IMAX movie. And I was uh, there. There you go. And Tony Myers was there, our director, James Nyhouse, our DP, and Marsha Ivins, a, an astronaut who had filmed a bunch of IMAX movies in space back in the 80s and 90s. She was a consultant. And so I spent a year learning the intricacies of sound, you know, like uh, Ben Burt was our sound instructor, a guy from Star Wars. He invented some of the Star Wars sounds, which was really cool. And Tony taught us things like um, you know, if it's not in focus, just delete the file because it's completely worthless. And she made us, we had to film our own movie. We had to come up with a plot. We were the actors. And then she processed it. And then a month later, we went down to the IMAX theater and we watched it on the big screen. And that was a humbling experience uh, to yes. watch. And uh, she had a big shot list of 300 shots. And so I was the one, I probably definitely took the most interest in filming IMAX. Some guys are just not interested in it. Um, but I, we shot the whole film on in my spare time. Uh, NASA didn't give us any scheduled time to film. It was all like, I got some time, let's make this shot. But Tony would always say, here's a, I have a question for you. Okay, so Tony would always joke. She, I think she trained 150 astronauts over her 30 year, wow. six, six or seven space film career. Um, and she would always tell us, if you see an alien, don't not film it just because it's not on the shot list. Um, and of course, <laughs> she was joking, you know, but the, in, on a documentary in a space, the point of have the camera ready and film what you can is very valid, right? 
Uh, but on a feature film, does that, do you ever get, have you ever like gotten a shot that wasn't on the storyboard or wasn't in the script, but man, that was a really good one. Let's use it. Oh yes. Um, oh yes. Very much so. Uh, especially more so action films. I, I very early in the piece, um, swung over to multiple cameras, uh, the whole Hollywood system pervading into Australia as well was a single camera coverage system. You learnt that and, and it was pounded into me in the early days of learning that, you know, you had to have a wide shot of medium shot to close up. If you didn't have that, you couldn't, it couldn't be edited. And in the lighting, if you, if you had to have a key light and a fill light and a back light, if you didn't have that, it would look awful. So all of that was pounded into us. It was like turn the page of the book of learning. And right. didn't kind of give you too much room to be creative. Right. So you had to do that yourself. And over the years, um, uh, with a signal camera, you know, I'd get often a little bit frustrated because I'd think, gosh, there, there, there's an angle there that we could be getting at the same time that's going to save a lot of money. Um, don't have to set up for it again later. It, it, it's there. And so it all happened in a little scene on Rain Man with Dustin and Tom, uh, the actors ad living, and they dropped some toothpicks on the floor. And, and, and the Raymond character, um, Dustin, uh, counts them very quickly. But the boys were ad libbing their reactions, and we were only shooting, I think, Tom, uh, uh, Dustin at that stage. We didn't, we'd have to reset up and do the whole lot again on Tom. So when they were ad libbing, I thought, this is ridiculous. They're going to take an hour to have to learn the lovely little moments mm -hmm. that they have in one angle, they have to learn it to be able to repeat it on the other angle. And I went over to Barry and I said, Barry, we should be cross shooting on this with two cameras. And he said, oh, I wasn't going to ask. And I said, we've got a spare body in the camera, in the, in the camera truck, give me two minutes, I'll set it up. And we shot it with two cameras. And I remember thinking, boy, this is great because they can ad lib. The editor can cut it for continuity. Right. And with for, for performance, not continuity. And I, from that day on, I, I used multiple cameras whenever I could. I, 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 I went to two and then later on Fury Road or whatever, we had a dozen, including, you know, eight crash cameras and, and uh, four production cameras running maybe. Right. Um, generally always two. A lot of directors I worked with weren't too au fait with the multiple cameras, didn't want to sort of do it, but I kept pushing because too many actors said to me, love it, love it, because we, we're both on and we can, we can, we can bounce off each other's right. rather than having to do a separate take of the reverse angle. Right. I've got always wondered up. that because actors yeah. are they're in character, right? They're playing off of each other. So why not film them both at the same time? At the same time. But I got into a lot of trouble, Terry, with it. Uh, <laughs> there, there was, a, the, people said I was shooting TV for cinema. Right. And I said, well, whatever you think, uh, whatever you think. But I mean, it, to me, it made a bit help, might've helped make a better move. And that's oh, all sure. that mattered, you know? So and then I started thinking about three caps four cameras and right. when we did Harry Potter um, with 600 kids and a, kind of a, a plethora of new young actors who weren't au fait with big cameras and lights all around them and they were very self-conscious on the first film um, and by putting in anything up to six cameras on that cross shooting on all of the kids right. I, I think it helped immensely uh, I don't think anybody's ever told me it didn't so uh, I feel it did work so I used it all the time no it makes sense to me I, I mean I've never done that but it makes sense is it more expensive to do that are you burning more film or you're you're doing less takes though right uh yeah there is a balance there but it is more expensive you need uh another uh, camera operator Operators focus puller on over, each right? on each camera so right. Yes, it, it is more expensive, but your schedule's even more expensive 
than that. And uh, on uh, Poseidon with, uh, with those actors, we were doing quite major dialogue scenes in half a day uh, using multiple cameras and the studio couldn't believe it. Um, so, you know, I think, I think when, you could, when you can save a half day on your schedule, uh, you're saving much more than the cost of the extra crew or film or whatever. Yeah, yeah I'd imagine if you, you have to keep on shooting over and over, that wears out the actors and maybe they're not, you know, but if you can get it all in one or two takes, that would, I would think that would be better. Well, yeah. actors, actors are weird cats. I mean, <laughs> I, I love them. I love them because they, they have to go out and take off their own personality and put somebody else's on mm -hmm. and maintain it, you know. Uh, right. and, and I think by shooting multiple cameras, when the act, two actors or three actors together, when they hit it, you can feel it. Right. And if you've got it covered on three cameras, you've got it. You don't have to go back and battle trying to get that moment again, that lovely crossover moment. Uh, it's already there. So, D Talk about your role with actors. Does the director of photography, obviously, I'm assuming you work with the director, hand in glove, with the writers, with the producers, with the actors. Do you work with those people too? A little bit. Not so much the producers uh, or the writers, because that's all done very much prior to the time that they'll uh, they'll go to make a film and, and gear up for it. Um, actors, very close with actors. Uh, it's a very close relationship, in fact, the actor to the camera operator. Um, it can be a dangerous situation um, because sometimes an actor might feel that the camera operator is giving is watching them so closely through the lens that they might have a feeling for the performance of good or bad and i've seen it happen and i've seen it happen with myself in that an actor would would look at you after cut they'd go you know a little look to say what do you think and it's a trap it's a trap you can fall into because you are now the director Right, right, right. And then the director's and, not happy. And the director could have some other... Me and I've actually met and talked with a couple of different directors who have said that that has happened on his films. Right. And uh, it's not good. It's not good to, to override a, a director. Right. So I always then, for years then, would, on cut, would throw my head down. So all I could see is the top of my head. I, I would have nothing to do with them. <laughs> That's actually probably a very wise thing to do. I could see that being a, a scene in a comedy movie where the actor is trying to get the camera operator or some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hollywood yeah. people would laugh at that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, also, um, CG versus live. People always ask me, what are your favorite space films? And I love Interstellar because it was a father-daughter um, story. I love The Dish, by the way, great Australian film. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. For Americans who haven't seen it, you should see The Dish. It's about the Apollo era, this big radar dish down under helping the guys go to the moon. It's a great story. Um, but I love Apollo 13 because it was real. They filmed that movie in the Vomit Comet. The, there's an airliner that pushes over. It gives you about 20 seconds of weightlessness. And I've got some ideas for shows I'd like to make. And if I ever make a space movie, I really am going to push hard to film it in the Vomit Comet because uh, CG just doesn't, computerized floating is not real floating. And so I love actual real human beings. So, but I, I'm guessing Mad Max had a lot of CG in it. Um, I don't know. But can you talk about that? Like Rain Man probably didn't have a lot of CG in it. <laughs> Witness, no. Witness didn't, I don't think, but you know, the Mad Max, I'm guessing, did. So talk about what you like, what you don't like. How does that work? I, I really loved in those, uh, uh, that era of Brain Man. I loved those films, uh, like Gorillas in the Mist, when you put the fantastic Sigourney Weaver, who really, really so made that film. She lived that character. Um, 
And it was so disjointed in the shooting, but she knew exactly where she was. So whatever the gorilla did, and he hadn't read the script, so you know <laughs> he he was doing whatever he wanted to do. Uh, so um, she would have to act like the end of the movie, and then all of a sudden she's at the beginning, and then all of a sudden she's at the middle. Exactly right. Exactly oh, right. Wow. And wow. We we had a wet bar set up in the jungle, and uh, at night we'd be down there having a cold beer after a long day, um, and and she would be there. Sigourney would come down, and then Michael would arrive, and. Uh, She'd say, Michael, Michael, I think we've got a little bit of take 82 and we might have the beginning of a, say, scene 135. And Michael would be writing it down and say, oh, good, good, good. You know, because it would be four or five days. If airline right. schedules worked, which they often didn't in Africa, uh, our dailies um, for that day wouldn't get back for four or five days. So we would have moved on. And, and we have to do everything um, uh, to... What's a, what's a daily? Describe what a daily is. The dailies are the film that we shot on Monday, we watch on Tuesday. Okay. And so they're the daily. Every day we'd watch the day before. That's if you're in LA or in a big city where you're processing your negative. But in Africa, as I said, it was four or five days if the flight's connected. If they didn't, it could be 10 days before we saw our dailies which now became weeklies so you'd send these big 35 millimeter rolls of film back to la to get them processed and then back to africa uh, uh, from africa we went to london to technicolor okay. london right uh often we'd go in different areas to rome there were labs right. in rome wherever the nearest lab laboratory was right. that right. could handle the 35 in a professional manner for filmmaking for cinema right. filmmaking right. Uh, we would use anything to sometimes it was by flights it was better to go a longer distance to London simply because there might have been a direct flight oh, going, right. To, right. going to Rome might have required say two flights and if they didn't connect then we lost a day or whatever so now with digital do you just watch it on the shot or do you, you can do watch, at the end of the day? or You can watch it there uh, on Fury Road. We did have dailies. They would uh, download the stuff and edit uh, all the rubbish off. Select takes would come through and we'd watch them on little iPads. Hmm. Um, the last film with George Miller in Sydney, no. We just watched it on the camera as we shot it. And that was, that was enough. And the director... <laughs> The director decides that, not the DP or not the camera operator? Every, or everybody watches? Uh, yes, everybody, nearly, nearly every department now has got monitors. There, there could right. be 20 monitors set up with every department watching their part of the filmmaking process on their monitor. <laughs> so, you know, performance and wardrobe and makeup and hair. And, uh, electrics, everything is watched on their own monitors. Everybody's watching it. So, yeah. but, so for Mad Max, well, I'm, I'm, I know some of that was CG and some of it was probably actual, I'm sure some of it was stunts, but how do you, can you blend in the CG onto the digital file and see that? Or do you have to wait to see that in your dailies? No, you have to wait uh, till post, till the movie's finished and it goes right. off to the uh, visual effects people and uh, two or 300 uh, computer operators will will paint that in right um, so you have to it, imagine that you, you have, have to, to imagine what that yeah. mountain is going to whatever it is that you're doing yeah. yeah there's new systems now which are very exciting coming in called volume which is a ginormous ginormous tv screen basically that goes behind the set you can join up two or three or four of them and you can put them in the ceiling they're very large, very controlled um, uh, machines, and you can actually shoot those for real uh, as background. So uh, they're doing a lot of the Star Wars, Dune um, films are using that because there's a static um, desert background, say, where you can put it on the TV screen and it's illuminated to the right illumination. And it actually helps to light the foreground as well they're finding and we did a little bit of, of volume on george's last film 
hmm. of a bus traveling and we needed Istanbul in the background. Um, so we had a, a, a cameraman shoot the plates in uh, Istanbul hmm. and he sent them down and we put them onto volume. And it's brilliant. It's a brilliant system. Wow. So it's actually, you're actually filming a TV screen, but the quality of the TV screen is so good that it goes into, yeah. the, it goes into a cinema projector. Wow. Well, our, our, col our colorist on uh, this latest, latest film uh, of George's, uh, he didn't pick it. He couldn't pick it. He said, really and truly, is that, is that the volume screen? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, wow. I didn't pick it. He said, I thought it was the, a real background and you were shooting live in the bus. Because you rock the bus, you know, you make the bus rock right. and the act actors, actors are reacting to a, a moving bus and the background is, uh, is a photographed background that was taken at a certain time of the day and then you have to light the bus to suit the background. Right. So That's you get, amazing. So it doesn't yeah, you, look like the bus is at noon and the background is at dusk yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So in the old days... Um, you actually filmed it on set on location or, you know, they had green screens, I guess, but there's no more green well, screens. Now that we, had, we had a lot of weird things through the years come, come on, you know, in the very early years, no, you just had to shoot it live. That's all right. there was to it. Right. Jump on a bus and, you know, hanging off the bonnet of a car. And it, it was pretty wild stuff, I must say. But then later we got rear projection. Right. Uh, where we could project with film projectors onto a screen. Uh, that required a big area, 90 feet, if I remember, was the uh, throw of the projectors. So you had to have 90 feet all around you to allow the projectors to uh, project onto the screen. Then we had front projection was an invention came out of Panavision London, and we tried that on a few films. Um, and then it became green screen, basically, to the digital revolution green screen blue screen whatever came in and uh and then it was all put up back on in post we'd go off and shoot the somebody would shoot the background plates and that would be put on in post the the big problem there was very often you didn't know what your background would be even and you'd go to the visual effects man on the set and you'd say hey what have you got going up there what's the image and they'd say well we don't know yet we haven't shot it and you'd say well I'd really love to have an idea of it to, to know how to light the foreground that's got to match the background. Yeah, <laughs> so, no kidding. You know, kind of page one stuff, but right. the, the organisations weren't keeping up with that sort of thing many a lot of the time. So it made it, uh, it, made it a, a little lottery there for a while. Um, one, of the, one of the cool things about film is stunts. And like, what are, what are some of the coolest stunts, scariest stunts, any accidents, any, any stunt stories like Gall Gallipoli? I know you weren't the DP for that, but I'm obviously there were a lot of stunt men in that movie. Mad Max was a movie of stunts. Um, any, any good stunt stories? Uh, look, I, I think I've got to say I've seen it all. I've seen the accidents. I've right. seen, um, well, there was once a stuntman came out from France to Australia and uh, we were doing a lot of man on fire kind of stuff. Right. And uh, the gelatin that was protecting him dried, dried a little bit quicker than it should have. Mm -hmm. And he started to get burnt. Ooh. And that's not good. Um, mm -hmm. They got him out. He was all right. But after that, we called him the French fry. <laughs> We'd have to get the French fry on. Uh, no, he was all right. So I think I think I can do the joke. But um, no, there were a lot of accidents, unfortunately. We were pretty, in the early days, shooting some of those early Australian films with a lot of motor cars and stunts. Everybody was pretty gung-ho. Um, right. There were no real safety barriers. There were no safety officers there to make sure that you were safe. Uh, stuntmen were... Uh, they were out to do the biggest, best stunts they could, so they weren't too okay with safety either. Right. So I think over the years I've seen a bit of everything there. Um, but nowadays on Fury Road, and I will say that George Miller has is is just he is so safety conscious. Right. Uh, he doesn't want anybody to break a fingernail making a movie like 
Fury Road. Right. And nobody was hurt. I mean, wow. One guy fell off one of those um, one of those polecat men, and he fell off. Uh, but luckily, he was okay. He, he bruised himself badly, uh, but he was okay. But apart, right. that wasn't a stump. That was sort of in between, and he just he just lost his concentration and fell right. off. Um, but for the actual stunts, they were so well choreographed by Guy Norris, so well done that there was no room there for any mistakes. Always a possibility, but Guy Norris covered him and all his boys covered themselves very, very carefully. It, it just isn't right that somebody gets hurt, injured, or sadly killed uh, making a movie. You want to get that on the first take, I'm assuming. You, you know, you, I'm the... the yeah. Generally, it is. Uh, once again, Guy Norris's boy, he, he and the boys set up the stunts in such a way, so well done, that most of those could be done 20 times and be perfectly safe. All of the, uh, a lot of, you know, 85% of the time in Fury Road, the truck's not moving. It is not moving. It looks like it is, but it's not moving. And so when we were doing the polecat fight, when when Max is fighting the guy on the polecat and he's swinging down onto the ground and the ground's running by at 50 miles an hour underneath, it's not moving. Visual Where effect. were you filming? In the, were you filming in the desert there? Or? We're in the desert and we're walking around with Steadicam and we shot it all on Steadicam. How did you get the ground around. to move? Is that CG then? or That's all CG, visual effects. They turned the wheels of the cars, they made the ground move. We had wind machines in and dust machines to give a bit of dust and movement in their clothes and hair and things like right. that. Uh, otherwise, no, we just, uh, in between takes, we just shut the wind machines down and walk around, <laughs> talk about it, and then fire it back up again. So it was all perfectly safe. That is amazing. Um, and that's 85% of the movie, Terry. You know. It was just standing, wow. So, but the actors yeah. have to be... You know, they have to look intense and they have to act like they're doing this incredibly crazy thing where they're just sitting there in a truck. Well, wow. yeah, it, it I again, I've had almost no experience. My very little experience has really made me respect and admire actors in that job that they do. It's so hard. I mean, to give the performances that you see on Netflix and on Amazon every single night or at the theater, it's amazing how they can put themselves in a different universe. That's a very, I think anyway, I think it's a unique a unique skill that-, that Oh, it's phenomenal. One of the greatest moments I've ever had in making films is a very simple moment uh, on a film called Lorenzo's Oil, which George Miller actually directed. Hmm. And I photographed for him years before I, I went back to work with him on Fury Road. And at Lynn Lorenzo's Oil, we had, Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon. And it's a very heavy dra medical drama about a young boy who's dying uh, and the parents find a, 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 a solution to his demise. And one of the most beautiful moments of, of, of helping to make films occurred on that when we had a very simple two shot of Nick Nolte, Susan Sarandon, and the doctor out of frame telling them that their child will die. And it's not something that any parent ever wants to hear. And when you're an actor doing it, you, I, I was doing a track in very slowly so that that heightened the tension. The camera helped to, yeah, to heighten the tension. And then it isolated onto Susan. And the performance she gave is just mind-bending. That she could, she's a mother, a, a mother of, 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 of a number of children, I believe, um, and a beautiful mother because the look that she gave is just awesome. And and when you help make movies with actors and you watch a woman do a performance like that in a film, uh, you've got to hand them everything. It's just yeah. so awesome. Um, that, that's what made a lot of the filmmaking for me a, a very beautiful thing was not the big, necessarily the big Fury Road action movie, right. but this quiet moment with a mother 
a, an actress playing a mother who's just been told that her son will die. And, and that, that just made it. And it's, uh, it's something that I just so admire in, in actors. And I, I think and I hope I learnt to give the actor the space, the room to do it and didn't overburden them with demands to keep your chin up, look across here, make sure you don't, you know. Uh, we, we tended in the earlier days to overburden them with demand. Sound department, do the same. You know, can you not swallow between lines? You know, can you keep your voice up? And the poor actors got to, to, to do this performance, powerful performance, and remember to do certain technical things makes it such an awesome job. And when you, when you look at actors who do that performance, either on films I've helped to make or films that I watch, I just admire them immensely, mm -hmm. immensely. I think they're, the, they're, the, they're what makes a real film. Yeah. I, um, I don't have much experience at all, but years ago I was on the final episode of Star Trek, the TV show, Star Trek Enterprise, uh, for a cameo. Um, a fellow astronaut and I, we, we were on there for like three seconds and Scott Bakula was the captain of the Enterprise, right? Yeah. For, for about a decade, if you Googled my name, that's what came up. It wasn't the fact that I was an astronaut. Or anything. Was <laughs> I was on Star Trek for three seconds with no speaking role. Um, and I remember being there and all of a sudden he came in and like he commanded the room. All eyes were on him. He was the captain of the Enterprise. There was something about his personality that yep. I don't have. Most people don't have. You know, there's there's a really to be a true star, and there you know there's lots of actors that have lots of important roles, but the stars. That's the only. I mean that that one moment I went wow. There's there's something. Yeah. You know, I used yeah. to think, well, they're just acting. You could just I could just pretend, but when I saw when I had my you know, one day on the set there, I realized there's something really special about stars that and it has such a commanding. I'm going to watch Lorenzo's Oil. It's on my, that's the movie you were telling me about with Susan Strand. Yeah. All yeah. right. That's on my to-do list. And uh, just to, you know, when you see that moment with Susan, oh gosh, it's powerful stuff, you know. I will, I will look for that. I, I, I loved, I loved her. She came to Sydney years later, in fact, only about two years ago. And she was in a big film festival um, and I was involved in judging uh, cinematography side and I was able to catch her and talk to her. And it's something that I found over the years is not a wise move um, to have worked on a film and then years later, make yourself known to that actor. It, it back, can backfire quite badly. Um, but so. Susan, Susan was so lovely. She right. jumped up and she gave me a hug and there were PAs there trying to keep everybody away from her and I snuck in the back way and, and managed to, to uh, and she was so lovely uh, remembering right. um, me on that film as the cameraman and I was operating as well um, so warmly uh, and I, I think because it was a very, very, very difficult role for them both in fact to take on a whole film about their son dying oh know. yeah that's a tough wow yeah well so john you started off <laughs> being jackaroo you know pulling sheep out of mud and you've won and you've been nominated a bunch i i don't know why i looked on imdb there's page after page after page after page of awards when did you know that you'd made it i think you could fairly say that you've made it right did you was there ever well, a moment like wow this is i'm not making eight millimeter films of sheep anymore this is you know there was when i the very first film that i was asked to go to america to photograph was witness and peter weir asked me to go oh. over to go with him and I, re, I i wobbled i wobbled a little bit that suddenly uh harrison uh forward harrison was Mr. Indiana Jones and right. suddenly there was I from low budget Australian <laughs> pictures and I suddenly had Indiana Jones in front of my camera. And Han Solo. Yep and I bottled a little bit. I thought oh I'm not going to handle this too well and a couple of things happened with the, new, the East Coast camera crew 
who were very um, camera crew, East Coast union right. thing. And a couple of things were said to me uh, that didn't help. And uh, particularly in that they felt I mightn't be doing it right. I was doing it in a low budget way, photographing, not in a, a big sort of production cinema, American right. style cinema production. And that worried me. I thought, well, I'm doing it wrong. Um, but Peter was happy with what I was doing. And things. so in, in the end, uh, uh, I went to Peter and, and I said, Peter, I, I'm worried. I, I don't think I'm doing this right. And, and he's a very astute man, of course. And he said, why not? And I sort of explained. And he, he latched onto it. And he said to me, he said, Johnny, what you've got to do is regard this movie. It's an Australian movie. So that's, a, that, that's all it is. It's an Australian movie. And it's just that all that other crew out there have got a funny accent. <laughs> but it's an Australian movie. They drive and I went out, on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> yeah. So I went out and I said, yep, no, that's the way we're doing it. Let's go. Come on. So we shot it exactly that way. That fixed me. That was my, that was my medicine. Um, but I got nominated for it. Right. And, and that, the, you know, the, I'd heard in America that once you're nominated, you never have to worry about work again. Right. In the American system. Uh, I believe it is, yes. I believe it is uh, sort of a, a, uh, an ongoing thing. Yeah. Once you're nominated, they feel you, you know your job. So. Well, I want um, to. That's, that's when I felt maybe I thought, you know, but I'm still not going to do it in any other way than the way I know how to do it. And that's, that's the Australian way. Did you film that in Lancaster County with actual Amish people? I grew up there. I grew up in Maryland. I spent my summers with my aunt and uncle, not in the Outback, but in Lancaster County. And we, yeah, we yeah. go to the Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, restaurants yeah. and we get the furniture. And so that was filmed on location with actual Amish folks. Not actual Amish folk. You're not allowed to photograph them. So oh, wow. we had to have act actors dressed up. Uh, we also used a farm that, that had uh, changed over to English and therefore we could film there. Right. Um, but uh, 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 no, there were no, no real Amish for photograph. We had our own carriages and horses um, and obviously stand-ins dressed English stand-ins dressed to look right. like them. We created a lot of interest amongst the Amish uh, younger people. They, they, they quite often, uh, we were shoot filming at night around right. our farm. It was surrounded by the Amish. And quite often we'd see them in the dark, just on right. the periphery edge of our lights, they'd be watching. That's and they would, have, they would have taken their Amish clothes off and put on English clothes right. to be able to walk walk to our farm and watch us filming it was quite I love that english is their word for everybody else right everybody uh, else yeah. non amish none and it's yeah. Pennsylvania dutch but that's really dutch is like deutsch right because i yeah. they were speaking german not not dutch exactly you know? yeah. yeah exactly so no it's, a, it's it's actually terry a line in the film where where the father says you know to uh, John Book, the Harrison Ford right. character, when he leaves the farm to go back to New York and become a detective again, he says, you be ca careful out there among them English, John yeah. Book. <laughs> right. I, I remember that line. I just watched it last night. I, I don't know that I'd ever seen it, to be honest. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So you, you said something. Once you're nominated, you never have to worry about work. But Hollywood, and I've been you know, in and out for the last couple of years. And I have a lot of friends in that business and we're talking, I've got a whole folder of projects I've written and want to get going. Um, it's a brutal business. It is a brutal business. You hear no constantly. It's a gig economy. It's not like going to work at Apple or Ford or AT&T or, you know, so talk about the challenges. If it, I don't know that people understand. We love our content and we watch it constantly, especially with with uh, the pandemic. But man, it's the people who film it. Look, and if you're Tom Cruise or Harrison Ford, that's great. But most people are not, right? It's a it's a rough life in Hollywood. 
It is. I think I will go back to what I've just talked about is the Australian way. Um, we had no money in Australia to make films. And what money we had, we used every cent of it. And every department tried to economise to suit that. And the camera department was, was no exception. I found that even when I was using multiple cameras, I loved zoom lenses. I used to think, why don't everybody? Why doesn't everybody use zoom lenses? You get the whole, uh, you know, six fixed lenses in one. So you rent one lens and you get all six. Um, but you could change it during the shot by by having zoom lenses and only one box of prime lenses. Right. Uh, for say three cameras or four cameras, uh, and so, say three zooms and one box of prime lenses for four cameras. I was very economical. Uh, when when uh, the American budgets were put in, it was often, you know, well, haven't you got that for each camera? <laughs> and I'd say, I don't need them. I'd only need four lenses to shoot with four cameras at any one time. So they couldn't believe it. So I kept, I think, I kept my camera department economical. Um, in Australia, we didn't have many crew either because of lack of money. You couldn't take on a whole lot of people. Uh, in America, it was a little different. They accepted that, so that's okay. But equipment-wise, lighting-wise, and speed, uh, because in Australia, we, didn't, we couldn't go over schedule. Right. We didn't have the money. So we had to shoot the film within that schedule. Right. And that, right. that meant taking risks uh, late in the afternoon, trying to make you know, five o'clock in the afternoon still look like 11 o'clock midday. Right. This so the producers have to, there cracking the whip. Is it the producer that keeps things on track? They try to. <laughs> <laughs> they do their best. Um, but I think it, sometimes it, it goes down to the cameraman. Right. Uh, if he's okay. slow, yeah, oh, yeah. If he's slow, uneconomical, right. he might not, not be asked to do the next film somebody right. else might and and i think over the years deep down i think i got a reputation for being economical and fast but the result was still reasonable reasonable you've got a well there's, page after page <laughs> after page of nominations and wins <laughs> well it's not bad well <laughs> well i was I, I might say i was lucky there um, <laughs> but but I always, I always shot the movies, I feel, to suit the script. I didn't try to, as I said earlier, bring my own uh, uh, look of a film or a look that I like to a, a film that may not really have that in its, in its era or its right. geography or whatever. So I just tried to clear my brain and go make the film as though it was the first film and therefore keep it true to the script. Um, and that's all I ever did, to be honest. Uh, I think it, uh, it seems to have worked fairly well. Yeah, that's amazing. So scripts are something that you've always read, obviously, but have you ever written one? Yes. So you've done some writing. I know a lot of directors, I guess some directors just direct scripts that they're given, a lot of them write their own script but you've actually done some writing too. I wrote a synopsis, uh, two pages, and not one producer liked it that I talked to, and it hasn't been extended at all. <laughs> no, I'm a cameraman. I, right. I, I even tried directing once, and uh, I think it made me a better cameraman. I went back to camera work. Uh, it was all a bit of a shock, and I went back to camera work, and I, I think... I, I became a better director, a better director of photography, right. because now I really understood what the immense problems of a that a director has to go through right. with with studios and producers, with money and schedules, scripts, actors, wardrobe, you name it. It's a big, big job, and I admire the the people yeah. who do it. I, uh, my, my total experience is almost nothing, but when I directed One More Orbit, um, I'd always thought of myself as a camera guy and I love cameras and, you know, I was the camera guy in space and we had our meeting before we were going to go shoot this around the world flight. It was a documentary about that. And uh, 
James Nyhouse was my DP. The first thing I did was ask him to be the DP. That was the best decision I ever made. And when we had that meeting with the other cameramen, we had three ASC members on my crew. So oh, I, wow. it was an embarrassment of riches. ASC is like the top level of Ameri like ACS for Australians. So um, I said, hey, there's, this is my vision. This is a story I want to tell. When you guys go here, look for this shot, look for that shot. And I handed it over to James and he immediately went into, I don't know what he went into. He was talking about stuff. I had no idea, numbers and parameters and aspect ratios. And, <laughs> and it was like, it, it was at that moment that I went, I'm not a DP. I love <laughs> ASC. I love the clubhouse. You guys are my people, but I'm yeah. not, I knew at that moment, I'm like, I think I can direct. I can, I have a vision. I can lead people. But I'm not a, I knew at that moment that I was not a director of photography. <laughs> there's just so much. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what you guys do because there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes in behind it. Um, I have a couple more questions for you, John, really quick to end, to end this amazing discussion. What don't Americans understand about Australia? Um, well, firstly, uh, you know, why, why we all eat so much Vegemite. <laughs> I think Tom Hanks uh, had a go at it and uh, had a few comments to make. Mostly I've heard it described as axle grease, full of salt. Um, Australian, but Australians love it. I think we, over the years, you know, having really been birthed out of the English systems of royalty and, right. and uh, whatnot, all of that uh, kerfuckle, um, I don't, we've thrown that away. Uh, we throw, threw it away. And, and I think we really try to regard everybody as equal human beings that, that maybe some have become more successful than others, but you're still the same human being and are treated as such um, and, and be treated as such. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we didn't, I, I don't, we, we might be now, but certainly uh, uh, only a few years ago, we we're all kind of, we regard everybody as equal. Um, it's just that some do that job and maybe they get paid more and others right. do another, but we're all, we all like a, right. a beer at the end of the day. Right. So uh, I think that still pervades um, and I hope it does forever because I think that's what makes Australia a very, um, a very likable country to be in. Oh yeah. Um, as you know, we have a lot of. Uh, we're getting a bit bureaucratic these days. I feel um, a bit too much. Maybe is uh, not doing us any good. Yeah. Uh, I hope we get over that. But I, I think it's that, and it's also a lovely, give it a go attitude. Mm -hmm. I did find that when I started working overseas. There seem to be boundaries uh, created uh, that we knew about but didn't care about. <laughs> and we just, you know, and, and somebody like a director like George Miller, mm -hmm. he will take you to what is pur purportedly a boundary that filmmakers have, have created. He just cuts the wires and keeps walking out in a no man's land and makes his films out there. So, you know, it's, it's like telling people that 85% of Fury Road, the truck isn't moving. Right. Uh, and yet look at the film. It's a, it's, a, it's a complete action drama. There's a lot of motion in that film. Yeah, and it's, it's not moving. We're all perfectly safe standing around drinking coffee. That's so, weird. Yeah. So it's, it's that sort of understanding and being able to go to a boundary and say, no, 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 we can go further than this. We, we don't have to do that. We can do this. And it'll still on film look, look good. It, but it pervades everything else, even our scientists, our medical people. They're up there with the rest of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I will say that our governments don't seem to appreciate that and give them the money they should have to continue deep research in a lot of areas. Um, but maybe it'll, it'll, it'll come good. But I think it's that give it a go. It's like having a look at the area. You want to do it here? Okay, well, okay, we can do it all here and make it work. There's a special connection 
that I think that America, that I feel towards Australia, um, you know, we've been kicked out of all the best countries in Europe and we're, we're kind of that, you know, colonist mentality. And there's something, Australia and America, I think are unique in terms of having that similar background. You guys have a little bit different accent, but other than that, yeah. we're basically very close cousins. Um, how about a, have you ever seen a show called Aussie Man? It's like Aussie a internet, Man? Aussie Man, yeah. No, no. Aussie oh, Man, oh my God, it's the funniest thing. This guy, yeah. he's, he's terrible, but he's so funny. He, Aussie Man reviews, so there'll be, people will send him slapstick videos or whatever, and he's Australian, very Australian, and he just makes hilarious commentary about it. You should check it out, Aussie I Man. I will, I will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's How about, so in the other direction, what did you learn about America? Like, what, is, what do Australians think about America? You know, most Europeans think Americans are fat and lazy and rich. Everybody thinks we're rich. What, what have you learned about America? Do you like baseball? Uh, no, never followed baseball. <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a sporting man uh, right. per se with cricket or, or football, which is our, our right. main Australian sport. Australian right. um, I think uh, my wife and I, we travelled a lot in America. When I finish a movie, I would uh, try and get the family over at that time and we would grab a motorhome or a car and we would drive America. It's beautiful geographically we we loved it all of the rocky mountains and that whole area the first time we did it we drove after witness in 1982 we drove across america the camera operator wanted a, a big old chevy ram van taken to to california and he said you take that and i had to repair it all the way across america you know it was so old but we camped and we weren't going to we were terrified that there was a chainsaw killer behind every tree. <laughs> and it was our lovely production, uh, uh, sorry, our lovely uh, locations manager, Michael Meehan, who now lives in California somewhere, who said, no, 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 you've got to drive across. It's got, you'll love it. Just don't drive from Philadelphia to, to, um, to the Midwest uh, across the wheat belt. And I said, we're, we're going to drive it because I've never been there. So we're going to do it. Well, I, I must say we'll never do it again <laughs> through, <laughs> through uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, we chased the uh, Pony Express Trail right across to that big rock um, yeah. that, that's in the movies. Um, and then we're down through the Rockies, went and saw Harrison Ford for lunch. And uh, we had a great time, but never forgot it. So after that, we travelled a lot in America. We, we get worried about a little bit about the fast food situation is so, uh, uh, so it's a little too plentiful, the plastic wrap thing. Uh, I think Australia up to the 80s, 90s uh, did a little bit more of the home cooking thing. Um, it, we've moved across now, of course, into a more uh, American uh, fast food systems, but um, uh, otherwise, we love the people that um, we, we've met and worked with, love them. They're, 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 they're wonderful, wonderful people. And, and as I said, we love the country too. So we've got uh, some lovely friends in Hawaii at the moment, ex-camera operator and his lady. Um, and we're hoping to get back soon to see them there, but also get back to America and do a quick round and meet a lot of the people that I worked with again, because I'm not going to work anymore. George's film, this 3000 years of longing is the last film I'm going to do. And um, my wife and I are going to find our own lives. Now we're going to have our own lives when we want to. Right. So we're looking forward to that. That is awesome. So you have a movie that you've shot. It just hasn't been released yet. Uh, yes. It's George Miller's latest one after Fury Road called 3000 years of longing. Uh, it's not a Mad Max. Everybody thinks it's a Mad Max. It's a very lovely little ensemble film with literally two people in a hotel room for 60% of the movie, which is a big difference to Fury Road. That's not Fury Road. Yeah, that's more like no. Rain Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like Rain Man. Yeah. Exactly. So we're looking forward to that. It, that too will be a very interesting little film. Well, I can't wait to see it. When does it come out? 
Uh, not till next year. There's such a backlog of films lining up for the academies this year that right. the studio, studio said, don't do it, we'll go next year. So it won't be out until, I don't know, October, November next year. Okay. Well, hope maybe I'll see you at a red carpet somewhere for that one. That would be amazing. Oh, that'd be lovely. I'd love to meet. Yeah, yeah. Well, John, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I, I would love to talk to you for hours. Um, if you're driving across America, I'll I'll have to drive out and see you somewhere in, in your retirement. That'd be lovely. And uh, thank you so much for being on on the show for Down to Earth with uh, Terry Virch. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. It was lovely.